everybody. I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something not through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's another day in paradise, and this is Debbie coming to you from South Florida. And again, it is a beautiful day down here. We have had some rain and my flowers are just happy, happy, happy. But today is another day of Stand Up and Speak Up, and it's International Day today, and I love doing that. I have love having guests from overseas. They're probably saying the same about us. We're across the pond from each other, and my special guest today is Krishna. Hope I say her name right. Krishna Ruparelia. Hi, well, Debbie. Good, good morning, Debbie. Good Wonderful morning. To be with you. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to our show. And you are outside of London right now, is that correct? So I live, um, I live in the Midlands, in near Birmingham. Um, so a couple of hours from London. And visiting your mom, and I love that because I visit my mom almost every day, and it's so much fun to have that connection. So welcome. If your mom pops in, we'll say hi too. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much. Now, um, Krishna, I've seen people call you Krish. Krishna, I'm going to call you Krishna. Unless you want me to call you, call you Krish. Krish, Debbie, I would love that. I will call you Krish. Uh, <laughs> I have not met you in person, which I have not met a lot of my guests in person the last couple of years, but I am friends with Sammy Blindell, and so are you. So mm -hmm. we have connected through the One Drop movement and, and um, Sammy's organization, and I'm so glad that, that we have done that and have this opportunity to have a conversation today because it's going to go ebb and flow like we talked about prior to the show. So let's just jump in. I'd like to start my show by going back a little bit in time to your background, where you grew up and what your family life was like. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So I grew up in, actually, I was born in London and my parents, so I have an Indian heritage. Um, I'm from an Indian background. And my parents had a very difficult time coming um, from Africa. My father was from Africa. Uh, he's no longer around. He passed away many years ago. And um, he came from Africa and set up a life here in England uh, 40 plus years ago. And it was, it was a tough time uh, because survival was key. So um, I grew up in an environment which was really all about survival. And uh, one of the beautiful things that my parents um, gave me was the emphasis of education, you know, having a good education uh, so that we, they, they suffered, so they don't, you know, they, they didn't need to see the suffering passed on to the children. So growing up in an environment where I would say that survival was the key, that money, or making money was a key driver in survival. Uh, my mother had different jobs. Um, she wore like secondhand clothing for many years and it was a tough time. So we, I've grown up with, you know, from humble beginnings. And I would say, yeah, like I said, we didn't have the luxuries. Um, my, I was the youngest, I am the youngest rather. I have a couple of siblings. Um, and what else can I tell you? Yeah, so university, I went to, I went to university, we all, I come from an educated family, as I said, that education was very much emphasized. So 
being a doctor or being a dentist that was really pushed into <laughs> my world and uh, and I think you know unfortunately I didn't do very well in my exams so I didn't make it to medicine or you know the key occupations of vocational occupation so I ended up doing psychology at university which I thoroughly enjoyed and I have a deep fascination for human behavior but what it left me with was this interpretation that I was not good enough yeah and I'm sure you're going to relate to that and I think that your listeners will also relate to it and yet our parents are so unconditional they do so much for us but somewhere along the lines something gets interpreted internally as a child and we interpret that that if I don't meet my parents expectations in their world then I'm not good enough and I was carrying that for many many years and that, that's interesting because I, you grew up in Europe and from my understanding it's a little bit different than the United States you guys go into tracks right when you're in middle school, is that when it happens? When you get split up and you go in the in the university tract or the, can you explain that a little bit? Because I can see how that might, well, it goes against everything over here where everybody gets an opportunity to do everything. And, you know, we don't want to hold anybody back because we don't want to hurt their feelings or their psyche or whatever. Did that have a, did that, I guess it played a role in not feeling enough if you didn't hit that mark yes yes so I think what you're referring to is that we have to decide early on right in our life whereas I think maybe in America it might be different where you can actually have more flexibility so here in England we have to pick our GCSEs which is a range of different subjects but then we have to do our um, high school qualifications which is the the A-levels just before university and we have to really pick we have to say if I wanted to go into medicine I'd have to pick the biology the chemistry the maths because that's the requirement in order to get into medicine and I did I did pick the science but I failed and failing in in my family was really not known and yet if we look at life failure is feedback and we're human beings, we're going to fail at some point. And so I grew up really believing that um, I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. And so as a consequence of that, if I look at my life from a distance, you know, I was highly driven to prove that I am worthy. And I did go to university, I did a psychology and management degree. So I have a background in occupational psychology and I've spent the last 16 years working in large uh, organizations in human resources and specializing in leadership development, well-being, resilience and coaching. And it's been a beautiful journey. I wouldn't change it, but there have been struggles along the way. And in my after university, I I tried to apply for work and I was getting really rejected by every company out there. So again, you know, that that was almost being reinforced as well, that I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough. This is not good. You know, so that, that narrative became the norm in my world until about my late twenties, when I had a bit of a meltdown and thought, you know what, I'm just not happy because I look at the count, my, my friends who were at the same university doing really, really well. Um, and I was, I had a deep level of dissatisfaction in my late twenties. However, things started turning around for me when I, I actually started to read quite a lot on personal development and I followed Dr. John D. Martini, I followed Tony Robbins. Um, so when I went to their programs, I started to realize that actually, you know, there, there is a lot more that I can be doing. And I think, you know, there is no such thing as failure. There is really just feedback. It's just that I think the world that we live in right now, Debbie, is that we want perfection straight away and perfection is poverty. And I think also that progress is really the only thing that makes us happy. And I'm sure that the listeners will relate to this, that we, we become so fixated on pursuing our goals that we lose the essence of happiness and peace. 
And I'm talking from the perspective of not me perfecting that because I'm still a work in progress, but I'm talking from the perspective of let's just reflect back. How are we showing up today? Well, I mean, that was my whole goal be behind my book, The Woman Behind the Smile. It's like we all put up that perception of perfection mm. because that's what's expected. And inside, you're just dying because you, you feel like you're not good enough or that what you did was a huge mistake and it has ruined your life and you can't move on. And, and that's what's so difficult. And I, I've been listening to a couple of things that you've done in the past. And I loved when you said that the only constant in life is change. Mm -hmm. There is. And yeah. that's the truth. That is the moving forward, the taking one step at a time. But have you found that you will take one or two steps, two steps forward, three steps forward, and then two or three back? Oh, back totally. Forth. I mean, that's my life right now. I'm an entrepreneur. I have uh, recently uh, founded my company, Unshakable Resilience, because I believe that millions of employees are waking up stressed and anxious and burnt out every day. And it's killing their focus, their productivity, and it's also killing the business. And I believe that there can be a different way. And so my business is very much focused on enabling leaders to become focused and productive so they can be thriving. And many people are surviving right now. So this is very difficult during the pandemic too, because everybody has been home alone. Yes. Trying to work as a team, but home alone. So when in your business, are you, are you going for the individual employee? Are you talking directly to the, the management, the bosses? Where do you start in that process? So I, I start working, well, my work begins with the top, top leaders. Um, because it's really about them looking after themselves. And I've created a program called the Unshakable Resilience Program, which really focuses on building uh, leadership resilience um, through four pillars. The first one is very much about mindset. So creating mental habits and strategies that can enable leaders to be at their best. And then the second aspect is around self-care and sustaining resilience. And resilience is very much about self-care strategies, not endurance. And the final step is really about leadership resilience, which is about agility. Because like you mentioned, the only constant we have is change. And for any entrepreneur who's listening to this or anybody out there who's managing a team or working in a, a, a corporate, you know, change is the only constant. But quite often we move one step forward, three steps back, one step forward, three steps back. And that's the nature of life. And we really have to have a very strong mind to be able to go back to that center within ourselves to say, OK, what, how am I going to interpret that that's happened? Because when we get rejected, when we have a failure, when we don't feel our best selves, it's very easy to get caught up in the negative chatter and that negative narrative, um, especially with the world that we live in right now, where we want instant gratification. You know, if I'm not perfect by tomorrow, there is something wrong with me. Well, and how, do you, how do you get people in those higher positions, though, to, to I, we're so competitive that it's win or lose. We don't want anybody to know what our vulnerabilities are. How do you get them to speak up? Because you have to acknowledge that you, you're vulnerable because we're all human. How do they acknowledge that in, in order to move forward? So before I actually work with them, I really try and understand the problems that they have in their business. And what is apparent is that stress is costing organizations over 42 billion pounds, certainly in the UK. It is phenomenal. And it's increased, the stress levels have increased by 30% because of the COVID pandemic. So organizations are now spending a lot of time and focus in prioritizing well-being because without a happy, healthy workforce, they don't have a business. So, but where I come in, Debbie, is I focus on the leader. 
because it's very easy for the leader to say, well, we have problems in the team, we have operational issues. Um, sorry about that. Oh, I was going to say, is that you or me? <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be me. I apologize. Okay. Um, so it's very easy to say that there are problems in the business, operational, strategic issues, but actually I'm focused on cultivating resilience from within the leader so that they have that capacity to manage the change. Mm -hmm. Well, because it starts from the top down. And if yeah. they, if they exactly. don't recognize it in themselves, they're never gonna recognize yeah. it in the person in accounts payable. Yes, 100%. And so leadership starts from within us. It's not out there. It's not at the top. It's about us and how we drive ourselves. But at the same time, going back to your question, I think that vulnerability comes from a space of where we create psychological safety. And when we are able to create a safe environment for the individual to show up exactly how they are and be in acceptance of that, then people are open. So when I talk to whoever it is, whether it be my neighbor, whether it be uh, a leader, whether it be uh, yourself, I've only just met you like a little while ago, you know, I wanna make sure that there is a comfort level in the dialogue because when people feel safe, then what actually happens is that the nervous system starts to relax. And when the nervous system starts to relax, they start, we start to feel safe and connected. And when we feel safe and connected, that's when a dialogue can happen very naturally. It's interesting because uh, in, my, in my world of being safe and connected, you have to be really safe and protect yourself because we, we lose our stranger danger feel. You know, when we meet online, it's interesting because within minutes, you and I had this connection. We saw each other. We have friends, mutual friends, which gives us a level of comfort. Mm. But online, you really need to be careful because we really don't know people who are on the other side of the screen. True. <laughs> but by opening up to people we do know and telling our own stories in a way, we do have a connection that allows others to open up and get stronger from the inside out. And that's why I open up because I want people to understand that we all have made a mistake or a misstep in our life. Yes. And we've all done something that the outside world really can put the victim blame on. And that's a shame because no one will thrive if they're in that victim modality. That's very true. And I love what you've just said there. You know, it is all about how you show up and your ability and your courage to share your story, share your vulnerability that paves the way to give other people permission. Exactly, and, and even CEOs of big companies. I mean, I started, I didn't start my company. I got thrown into running my company because my husband died. It's like, boom, one day he's running the company, the next day I'm running it. I didn't know how to run it. And in my mind, you know, because I am so self-sufficient in so many ways, I'm like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. I don't, I'll figure it out. Well, the very first production that I missed because I didn't know the timelines and I wasn't asking, I was like, I'll never do that again. And then, I, you know, then you're scrambling trying to make things right because you want the customers to be happy and you want all these things to, to be flowing properly. But the point here is that we can't do this alone. No. Your clients can't do it alone. They're not going to have a company if they're trying to run it by themselves all the time, right? 100%. See, I have a philosophy in my business, and that is that, you know, focus on what your superpower is and what you're good at, and then outsource everything else. Because the purpose of having a team is that together, everyone achieves more. And the, also the purpose is to have a diverse team where everybody complements each other. Now, I will have strengths that you may not have, and you will have strengths that I may not have. But if we come together, then, you know, that's the purpose of the team and we can start to achieve and start to drive results. So we're not meant to be doing everything on our own. And the purpose of business, if we think about the business and the network of people that are entwined in business, it's really the leader that's influencing the manager, that's influencing the team, that's influencing the individual, that's influencing himself to deliver to the customers. 
And it does take a very powerful, confident leader to give up certain things. Yes. Yeah. To not micromanage. I mean, I see that all the time. Yeah. And and you lose your workforce if you if you as the top dog is putting the stamp on the envelope that's going out the door. Yeah. I mean, it surprises me, you know, that because yesterday I was um, actually doing another interview yesterday, too. And I came to realize that some people because with the COVID pandemic, a lot of had to work from home and some organizations have decided to put some devices on um, the, 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 the mouse on the, the, the mouse and the, the laptop so that they can actually monitor how much people are working oh and whether the mouse, mouse is moving. And I just think, oh my God, this is totally, completely diminishing trust and safety. And again, you know, again, with my psychology background, Debbie, this is really parent child. Yeah, we wanna to move to adult, adult at the end of the day. Everybody has humanness about them. And if we treat people like adults and we treat people with that level of res- respect that I'm trusting you, trust is very intangible. So you can't measure it to a degree, but just by sharing that I'm trusting you to, to do your work, we focus more on productivity rather than how much people are logged on. Exactly. And if they're, if they're getting the job done, that's the point if it takes you an hour Mm -hmm. or it takes you three hours as long as you're getting it done and you're getting it done properly i mean i've found this kind of a mindset it is a mindset that's your first your best first uh step is the mind step or the the mindset reset uh i know as a 60 something or over we look at some of the millennials who are coming into work at nine o'clock and leaving at four and you're going what are you doing? Because we got the older guys that are in there, the workhorses that are there at five or five thirty in the morning, working till six at night and getting done what they get done. But it just it's funny how how the different ages look at each other and say, well, I would never work that much or you're not working enough because you're not in enough. Uh, it's we're not looking at their productivity necessarily, because I always tell them, and this is my husband and his business. I was like, the young guys are driving you old guys crazy. But look to see what they're doing. Look mm. at the connections they're making. Look at the jobs that they're doing. If they're not getting their, their job done, who do they report to? And they need to have a conversation. You as the top dog, the boss, do not have to go into that project manager and tell them what he should or shouldn't be doing. There are other levels. So you've got more important things. Like your superpower is not to be telling that guy. I said, you gotta, you got to take the hands off the reins a little bit. Let them do their job. Because with technology, which they have, that they might be a little more proficient at than you guys, the older guys, let them do their jobs, learn from them, and then have them learn from you and work together. It's tough. It's tough to change, especially the mindset of the older guys. Uh, But they're learning with time. Uh, But that's so important that it does start from the top down. But in your life, have there been times when you know, you've had people on you or, or just telling you what to do or not telling you what to do. And you're just, when do you ask for help? Yes. So do you mean by a manager telling me what to do and how that sat with me? Or do you mean? Uh, let's, even in, in life, you know, and I, I, there was something when you were younger too. Um, well, we didn't really go into this, but about the accident and after the fact. And when you had you were very physically fit mentally fit you know this whole mind body spirit thing you you felt in your earlier life that things were just peachy just fine right but then you had one of those defining moments where poof that changed can you tell me a little bit about that and how it changed you and your perception of what you do today yes of course so I was this very vibrant girl who was traveling around working in London Um, I was working for one of the top um, business schools in the UK um, and I was living a really proactive life and things completely changed at the start of lockdown. So this was only a couple of years ago. So it was around February 2020. And I remember clearly, actually, I even remember the date, 4th of February 2020. 
something wasn't really right with me and that day you know I, I practice a lot of yoga so I'm also a yoga teacher so I practice yoga that really sets me up for the day I do a meditation and even though I had practiced that 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 morning when I got into work I had um, my colleague asking me that you know are you okay and I burst into tears I was in just not in the right space so I nearly crashed my car going into work and that was the defining moment for me that something was dramatically wrong um, so I booked myself in I mean there were talks with my doctor that I had a thyroid condition and some of the thyroid symptoms is chronic fatigue and depression and anxiety and again you can see from my body language I'm quite a vibrant I mean. I have a lot of energy and you know I share that energy with the people that I interact with and that's just my personality but I really was in a different state so I had like my hair I was, my hair was falling out my skin was blotchy um, but the most debilitating thing that happened was the fatigue I could not even get out of bed so I, I checked out of work I had to go on sick for three months my social calendar completely stopped and I was just trying to figure out what happened to me because how can I suddenly go from being okay to not okay so there was a transition I was feeling like that a couple of weeks I had spoken to my doctor a few months ago saying you know I have you know what is going on really and they said well you have got some thyroid issues but it's not really a, a massive issue because um, the, the markers are not telling us that we need to give you a thyroid supplement uh, not a supplement a hormone so I went private I went to see a nutritionist um, but it took a long time so six months and of course because chronic fatigue is not like cancer and it isn't like you've you know broken a leg my family weren't that supportive so when I said to them that I'm really struggling and Debbie, I'm not that type of person to say that I'm struggling because I'm usually the person who mediates in the family and I'm usually the person who's parachuted in when there is a problem. So nobody really understood. I felt incredibly lonely. It was a deep, deep, dark time for me. And, um, you know, you could say that I was quite depressed. I was very anxious because the quality of my life diminished. Mm. And... This is now supported by Dr. Deepak Chopra, who says the same thing, that on a scale of one to 10, if you're actually below a four, you're heading towards a crisis and you're going to have a breakdown at some point, the quality of your life will completely diminish. And so I had to change so many things in my life, because of course, when I went to the doctor, they said to me, sorry, we can't really help you because the thyroid is actually just a little higher but it's not in the bracket that warrants a medication so I'm sitting there going well why am I feeling really terrible <laughs> so I had to educate myself with so many different lifestyle factors um, there's a lot of research now that talks about your gut health you probably are aware <laughs> and I also follow the likes of Dr Mark Hyman who is a functional medicine expert and so I went to see a nutritionist, I had to change a lot of my diet. Um, my diet, diet was generally healthy. I'm a vegetarian, but I wasn't allowed gluten. I wasn't allowed soya. And I was living on all of that. Mm. Um, I wasn't allowed, um, you know, dairy. So, but not only that, I had to even focus on the fact that, you know, chemicals in the products that we are using. So makeup and creams and toiletries, they also are having an effect on the autoimmune condition that I'm suffering with. So in a nutshell, it was a really difficult time. So I had arrived at my rock bottom and I just was begging. I was praying like anything that I really want my health back um, because during the day, I couldn't do a lot. The only thing I really did was I got on my mat and I started teaching yoga during the pandemic as part of a charity organization. And that really gave me some level of hope that I was reaching out from my pain. I was reaching out to other people and it helped me to step out of myself. And then also what I did was really start to learn to cook different dishes, which I was very resistant to because what would that okay, this has to be gluten-free, this has to be dairy, this has to be soy. And, you know, I felt really, really um, sorry for myself because 
I just felt like I didn't have a lot of choice at the time. So I was quite down emotionally. Now, the good news is that I'm fully healed now. So I look after my health uh, very well. And even more so now, because I would say on reflection that, yes, it was a thyroid issue. But I would also say that there was an element of anxiety there. There was an element of stress there. We hold a lot of stress that we are not aware of. And we carry that. And especially when life events happen, we just carry on like, we can dust it off, but somewhere along the lines, the body never lies. And there is a lot of research now that shows that, you know, the body, mind and emotions are very intertwined as well. So the beauty of that experience was that I have developed my business out of that, you know, unshakable resilience has come out of that because in, in line with the fact that, yes, I've got a lot of experience in human resources and I've, um, often implemented various different resilience programs in different companies. But I would say that that was the beginning of my journey to really start to share what I had learned and the program that I've created enables leaders to start thriving rather than surviving. And yeah, take them because out. there's no guarantee that we've got tomorrow. No, absolutely not. And I mean, you know, life is ever changing and we just don't know. And we are so consumed with our day to day living that for me, I really had to pause. I had no choice but to pause. Um, but I really now on reflection, I, it has completely changed me in how I show up. I have so much more compassion to myself. I have a lot more compassion to people who are suffering I am a lot more conscious of my presence in how I am showing up in my life. So, for example, you know, I'm I used to be or I still am very kind of extroverted, but I take time out, you know, to really pause. So I go on to meditation retreats where I'm not talking to anybody for days. And I love that. It's something that I do very um, regularly and it's very healing to do that. So you see. There is always uh, some level of gift in any experience. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I, can and I can say that now. You can say it now. Back then, we probably not so much. Because yeah. I'm like you. I, I take I take supplements. I'm not on any medication. <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, I take. My husband teases me if I have half a half a Tylenol, half an aspirin. I get you know terrible nightmares at night. It's crazy. Um, but I try to do the best I swim three days a week I you know we do the things that we our body feels comfortable with but yes. there are times and, and it's just not regularly I I get this just itch right in the v yeah over my heart uh -huh. and I'm thinking there's some sort of stress going on inflammation over my heart mm. that typically is when I've had an issue with one of the kids and I, as a mom, you want to be a control person. Uh -huh. And my kids are all 27 and old, over now. And there's not much control I have over any of them, which is probably a good thing. But the youngest, when he was having some troubles, and I was very involved in those issues, that was very stressful for me. And it manifested itself in just the skin itch. And my, my doctor's like, there's no reason. There's nothing we can do. They can't put anything on it. So I just had to just take a pause and just breathe through it and say, knock it out. I didn't change the soap. I didn't change anything in my life. It just happened. And it's uncomfortable when those things just happen out of the blue, especially if you can't do anything about it. And I've heard you talk too about, you know, trauma is in our cells. Yes. It's there. How do you, and so many of us just put on that mask and say, oh, nope, we're fine. We're fine. But inside, how do we recognize that there is something there uh, and can we, before we get, you know, hit a brick wall saying it's there, listen to me. How, how do we recognize that? How do you get your clients to recognize some things that may have happened to them that are guiding them the way they're directing their businesses today? Yes. So I, what I do, what I love about what you've just share, shared is that you've made that connection that something's happened on the outside and it's manifesting in, on the inside and people often don't make that connection 
Okay, because at the end of the day, our emotions that we're not conscious of are running the show. <laughs> and until you become conscious of what's going on, it will run your show and you will call it destiny. So in answer to your question, what I tend to do is asking that one simple question, firstly, to pause. Breathe into that space of where you're feeling it in your body. And for you, it was in the heart space. Okay, naturally, because the heart chakra, there is a heart energy center in the body. And that is all about where love is, fear is, you know. So just checking in, how am I feeling? And then breathing into that space. So you're spot on with that. And asking that question, how am I feeling? And then pausing. Because quite often what happens is that because we're so busy in our lives, we don't ask that question. And I'll tell you why. It's because sometimes it can be very frightening to feel the emotions of discomfort. And yet, if you were to stay in the space of feeling the emotions, that actually builds resilience. And research has proven that, that people that have a high level of resilience actually allow to experience those feelings. And just notice that once you feel those feelings, after a while, what happens? You start feeling better. You're, exactly. You you're start feeling better. And also you may notice that the feelings may change. Mm. Because the way I see it is, you know, this is a getting into more philosophy, but Everything in life is changing, right? And we are not our thoughts. We are not our emotions. We are not our feelings. So it's a little bit like the cloud that's passing by on a summer's day. We just have to look at the sky to realize that the sky, the, the, the sky is moving, sorry, that the clouds are moving by. And it's very dynamic. You know, it's moving. It's, it's flowing. And so emotion is energy in motion it's not stagnant right yesterday I could be feeling great today I could be feeling rubbish you know 10 minutes ago I might be feeling grumpy emotions are just energy in motion and it's ebbing and flowing but we have to compassionately have that dialogue with ourselves rather than pushing it away and again I'm not making out that I'm an expert it's a realization I've had very recently because when I used to feel fear, I feel it in my stomach. Mm. And there's a sense of anxiety, the, the butterfly sensation, the knots in the stomach. And my first question would always be, why am I feeling this? Oh my God, let me go and perfect it. Let me go and rectify that. So I would do a very fast run or I would go and uh, go on the yoga mat and try and move this energy. And whilst that is good in one respect, what I really was doing was actually avoiding it. And when you avoid something, when you resist something, it persists. I have a, a one of my favorite books right now is uh, by Su Dr. Susan Jeffords. It's called Fe Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. I love her. Yes. It's, she's wonderful. I listened to it on Audible and I got the book and I am highlighting it and all that. But it's true. It's the way I used to talk about that fear, that nervousness, uh, especially getting up to speak when I first started speaking about what had happened to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I finally said, you know what? It's not fear. I'm not going to be anxious. I want to be excited because mm -hmm. it makes me feel good from the inside out. Because mm -hmm. I was one, like I'm sure many of your clients, where I didn't want to address the, the feelings. I was too busy. I would, and I had a friend who, uh, she tried to get it out of me one time. And she said, if you look at your body as a piece of Swiss cheese and the holes, I had a really big hole that over 26 years of marriage felt like I hadn't been listened to. Big hole. Mm -hmm. When I got involved in the online relationship for two years, guess who listened? Listened for two years. I have 4,000 pages of journal that filled that hole. So when it came crashing down and burned, I was okay on the inside because for two years I had someone that had listened to me. Mm. And so that was the positive that came out of something horrific. And that's, I think, what we need to do is look at those things and recognize them and talk about them if you can and make your pain turn into your purpose. Yes. And move forward because it's, and it was funny, you said something about the cloud. Last week, my guest, Gail Dixon, uh, was talking about, we don't live under a black cloud 365 days a year. 
And I laugh because my husband and I play golf. He plays a lot more than I do. But when on a hot summer day in Florida, when that black cloud comes over the golf course, you can look at it two ways. Oh, shoot, it's going to rain. It's going to ruin my golf. Or, wow, it's really cool because it's blocking the sun and I can not be so hot right now. It's a Mm. good feeling. It's mindset. It's the way you look at stuff. It's your attitude. And I love that's what you're doing on a corporate level, because I think I haven't been in corporate years ago. The top guys didn't recognize what was going on at the bottom. Mm. And they push you for numbers. They push you for sales. They push you for all these things. And you're, and you down there are saying, this doesn't make sense from my point of view. Can we talk about it? Unfortunately, I had, I was a strong enough older gal that I could go to the boss because she was my friend. She was my age. And I'm like, why are you letting those middle guys tell us to do this when it's counterproductive and we're doing it another way for somebody else too? So you're burning people out at the bottom because the guys at the top aren't listening. I said, best way to run a company is work at the bottom and work your way up so that you know everything in between. And then the workers can't pull the wool over your eyes when they're trying to you know, think that I can do this because the boss doesn't know because the boss does know. And then you know what they're doing and it, it all works together. And that's what this is great, especially in today's world where we're so, we are working at home. Mm. My, daughter, my daughter's a single mom and she works for a big financial services company here in the States. And it's good for her to work at home. She's a single mom. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, once the kids are off to school, she can do what she can do, but there's no one there that's measuring her mouse. Thank goodness. That would drive her crazy. You know, she gets her work done when she's online, when she's on, she's on. I think it's really about the the leadership, the definition of leadership has really shifted and it is evolving. And if the leaders are listening right now to your recording, you know, if, you don't change your mindset, you will not have a business because employees want autonomy right now. They want to have that freedom. They want to have flexibility in their roles that they're doing so that they can juggle work-life balance. They can juggle the priorities like your daughter. Um, We have to recognize the fact that there are a lot of benefits working at home, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and there is, it doesn't necessarily have to be that people have to travel and come into the office. For some people, yes, absolutely. But wherever possible, that flexibility is what is needed now and what is wanted and desired by employees as well. So, you know. It's- well, right, it's, it's the empathy, seeing what their life's position is because not everybody, I mean, by the time you're the top, the top leader, you typically don't have young kids still at home. You're at a different point in your life. Yes. And I see that with me and my friends and my husband and I too. I, I remarried after, after uh, Luke, my Lou died. I, I've been married for seven years, but we're at a different place now mm-hmm. in our mid sixties than we were in our twenties and thirties. Our priorities are different. You know, we can see the young guys that have the small kids and they're just running around going crazy. And we're going, thank goodness we're not there anymore. But we've been there. So we recognize what they're going through. And if, you know, working from home or changing that environment uh, takes a little of their stress away, they'll become much more productive and better for the company. Yes. So it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, how you, I I love what you're doing. I think it's great. I think all companies need it, uh, especially the ones that were brick and mortar and have gone virtual. Yes. It's difficult because you don't have control of, you know, where's that pencil going? Where's that mouse going? You don't. And sometimes that's okay. Most times it's probably okay. Yeah. So. And research now shows that only 11% of employees feel engaged and it's costing businesses $7 trillion employee engagement or the lack of it. So organizations have a real task now leaders have to create a lot more connectivity especially in a hybrid setting you know it's easy when you're in an office to a degree to be able to have conversations over coffee you can have a catch-up by the water cooler Mm -hmm. you can observe what's going on but you know when you're only off on screen you can't really do you can't really have a lot of um you don't have a lot of observation 
And so leaders need to create that environment where connectivity is even more um, important. And the only way that can really happen is by being honest and transparent and saying, look, this is where it is at the moment, right? And leaders that are sitting in an ivory tower and not listening to the people on the shop floor are not going to be around for a long time. That's the bottom line. Right, and, and they have to welcome dialogue in yes. civil dialogue on everybody's side. I think that's a lot of the problems I see in the world is that there's such divisive dialogue. Mm. And, you know, for the folks that are sitting at home that are working at home, they need to be able to express the frustrations of what's going on, either technological, you know, technology problems or communication problems or the clients or, you know, even working between teammates because you're not there, you're not rubbing elbows, you know, you might have a teammate who's not, you perceive them not doing their job. And so you're frustrated because they're passing it on to you or they're, they're going on a break and leaving things hanging. There needs to be some open dialogue on, on how do we work together with this? How do we fix this? Uh, and, and not have any repercussions if you're an honest person and say, I feel that this is a problem for me, you know, I remember I did that years and years ago. I, went, I worked for a bunch of lawyers and I walked in and, and said, guys, I think we're growing. We need more help. So what did they do? They fired me and hired two more people. Hmm. One of the best things that probably could have happened to me now that I look back on it 40 years later. Uh, but it, boy, talk about a disconnect in what was happening in the company. Yes, and quite often the culture, it's the culture you see there, they might have interpreted it as, oh, well, if you need more help, that may mean that you're not competent, <laughs> when actually it might mean that, hello, your workload is increasing, and I'm about to drown in stress, and you're not hearing me. Um, so I think, you know, there has to be that shift in, in, in culture as well. And that's what, that's really the work that I do. You know, we have to bring these tools and techniques to the likes of leaders that are driving the organization so that they can thrive in leadership, but also empower the, their teams and the individuals that are working in the company. Um, and it's very necessary right now. So how our time is flying by and I knew it would. How can people contact you if they would like to learn more about your program and uh, sure. where can they get to you? So I'm everywhere on social media. So you can go onto my website. It's called www.unshakableresilience.co.uk. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, uh, you can email me krishna at unshakableresilience.co.uk. I can offer so many different ways of connecting. So uh, an initial 30-minute discovery call. Um, so if you are a busy leader, if you're a busy professional, and you are prioritizing well-being for yourself as well as your team, then stay in touch and or get in touch. And um, I look forward to, to working with you. And you have a podcast too, don't you now? I do, of course. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for reminding me. Yes, I have a podcast. It's called The Unshakable Resilience Show. I've had various different guests on my podcast as well. Again, they share their various different leadership insights as well, different strategies on what they are doing to taking care of themselves to um, in this new normal, really, which is very strange times right now we live in. <laughs> um, so yes, have a look. It's available on Anchor, on Google, on Spotify. Perfect. And even though she's sitting over in England, the world's a pretty small place right now. We can do anything okay. online. And you're well connected with Sammy Blindell and mm -hmm. the brand builders right? And the one, one drop movement? I am very much so, yes. So Sammy is my mentor um, and uh, she's wonderful and she also passes her love, Debbie. So well, I'm she's a sweetheart. Yeah, she emailed me this morning with a video. She goes, I think you need to look at this and it was about oh, some oh, a scammer you. video. Uh, oh, but yeah, she and, she and Greg <laughs> are wonderful. Well, Krishna, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for what you're doing and and you enlightened me a little bit and I really enjoyed the other uh, YouTube videos that I that I saw you in. Uh, so I want people to know too that we just remember that the only constant in life is change and it's up to us to jump and to take to feel uncomfortable, 
no, feel comfortable being uncomfortable because that means we're changing and that's a good thing. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to leave them with one uh, one uh, quote that I often uh, say to myself, that either we have the choice to respond to what's going on, or either we have a choice to react. And so I would leave it to your listeners to decide which one feels better, which one brings fruitful results, really, responding or reacting. Perfect. Well, we'll respond to that by saying thank you so much and wishing you a very nice evening over there. And my viewers have a wonderful day. It's again, another beautiful day in paradise. Thanks thank a lot, you, Krishna. You thank bet. you. Thank you for listening to Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you are the victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, make a small donation to help victims around the world receive the help they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfotemine products at BenfoComplete.com. Use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thank you for being with us today. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional resources and information. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays. My books are all available on Amazon.com and Audible, and I encourage you to join us again. Have a great day.